Hi guys, it's MJ and in this video I want to give you a lesson on decision theory. Now this is going to be one of four videos, so this is going to be part one, and in the later videos we're going to discuss some more complicated things, but before we can get to that we need to learn the basics, we need to understand the fundamentals. So in this video I'm going to be going through something known as zero sum games and I'm going to be introducing a lot of terminology, a lot of notation which we're then going to see being applied in the later videos. So let's start off with an example. I mean when it comes to decision theory it's all about playing games, it's all about you know seeing what strategies player A has and what strategies player B has. So let's give them a game and this could be this is a game matrix that could be applied to, to any game. Um, what we do is we show player B's strategies with numbers 1, 2, 3. And with player A, we're going to use the Roman numerals. And the point of the game is player B wants to maximize these points and player A wants to minimize the points achieved by player B. So this, these are the following point structures. So we've got 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 1, 3, 2. So what's happening here? If player B had to say choose option 2 and player A had to choose option 3, then the amount of points received by player B would be 2 points. So this is the matrix. Each option corresponds to another option and gets the following points. Okay. Now, what is the first thing I want to show you? The first thing I want to show you is, is there any strategy here that is just downright silly to play? And what I mean by that is that, is there an option that is always going to be better than the other option? So, let's take a look. If we had to say, from player A's perspective, if we had to look at, say, option 2 and compare it to option 4, we can see that if player B chooses 1, in option 2, he only loses 0 points, and in option 4, he loses 4. So it's less than. For the second choice, he loses 2 compared to 3, so that's less than. And in option 3, he loses 1 compared to 2, so it's less than. So what we're seeing here is for player A, option 2 is always better than this option 4. And when this happens, we say that option 2 has dominated option 4. So this is domination, when one choice is always better than the other choice. And we can also see it from, from player B's perspective. But what we have originally is a 3 by 4 matrix. Domination reduces it. It makes it more simpler. It's now a simpler game. But let's look if there's any domination from player B's perspective. So here we want the numbers to always be bigger. So let's see, does option 1 dominate option 2? Well, 2 is bigger than 1, so that's good. But 0 is less than 2, which means option 1 doesn't dominate option 2 because in certain instances option 2 is better than option 1 and in other instances option 1 is better than option 2. But if we look here at option 3, we see that 4 is greater than 2, 1 is greater than 0, and 3 is greater than 1. Which means option 3 is always going to be better than option 1. So we can actually take option 1 over here, and this can be dominated. Interesting to note is that if you had looked at player B uh, for the first time, you would not have seen this because this 4 over here is greater than 2. But because we know that player A is never going to play option 4, we know now that player B's uh, strategy number 3 dominates strategy number 1. And I mean, we can continue. We can see that going back to player A, um, 2 is less than and equal to 2, and 1 is less than 3. Remember, player... Um, a wants to minimize the score, player B wants to maximize the score, which means we can also 
dominate this here. And now our game has gone, I mean, all the way to a two by two matrix where player A can either choose one or two and player B can either choose four, I mean, can either choose two or three as his choices. And so what domination does is it helps us to simplify the game into a smaller matrix and helps us identify which strategies are always better than others. Now I want to introduce another concept because now how do we decide between option two and option three? You know, what happens when we've dominated all the various strategies and we're left with the matrix? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just make a bigger matrix just to make the explanation a little bit more easier. So let's say we have another game with player B and we've got option one, two and three. And then there's player A and let's also give him three options this time. And that doesn't look like a three. There we go. And these are the following scores. So same rules as last time, player B wants to maximize the score, player A wants to minimize the score. Now what do we do in the situation? Now we could do the whole domination thing, but I want to show you a thing known as the minimax criterion. So the minimax criterion is going to help us, or it's going to be a strategy that we're going to employ to help us make our decision. And what this is saying is, let's choose the best of all evils, or let's minimize our loss. So when it comes to player A, and what's called the, the mini-max is for player A, we are going to want to minimize um, the worst score that they can get. But for player B, we want to maximize the score. Okay, so we want to maximize the worst score, and here we want to minimize the worst score. So this is almost a very risk adverse strategy. So if we had to say, look at player A, what is the, we want to minimize the worst score, so we want to see what is the biggest score that is going to, to hurt us. So in option one, we see the biggest score is six, we see for option two, the, the biggest score is three. And for option three, the biggest score is five. Okay, this means that we want to minimize the worst score. So these are the worst. And we now want to minimize the worst. So it's going to be option two. That is going to be player A's best strategy with the following game matrix. Player B he wants to maximize the worst. So the worst situation here is that he gets two points. The worst situation here is that he gets three points. The worst situation here is he gets one point. So these are the worst situations and we want to maximize these. So it's option one that gives three points, which is option two. So we can see that the min-max criteria for player B is to choose option two, and for player A is to choose their option two. Now, what becomes quite interesting is we're gonna introduce something known as a saddle point. So, a saddle point, this occurs when we see that there is the largest number in the column corresponds to the smallest number in a row. So, we want for the column, we want the largest number, and for the row, we want the smallest. We want the smallest. And what we're seeing here is three is very much the saddle point. It's also when what we have here is that this, can, this value can also be seen as the value of the game. So, why I'm saying it's the value of the game is because if we had to play this game a lot of times, we're going to see that this is going to be the outcome expected on most of the games. Player B is going to choose option two. Player A is going to choose option two. Player B is going to win three points. Therefore, in order for player B to play this game and for it to be fair, he needs to pay three points in order to play. So that is 
the value of the game. Nice and simple, nice and easy. But what do we do when the game matrices are not this easy? So let me now show you one loss matrix before ending off part one of this video. So that was quite a nice matrix in the sense that we had a saddle point. Now I'm going to show you what happens if we don't have one. So let's say we have player B and we have player A. Player B has two choices. Player A has two choices and they are as follows. Okay, what do we do now? Because, I mean, we could do the min-max criteria. I mean, here it would be negative 6 and 1. So player B is going to choose 1, which would be the strategy here. Player A is going to have over here. So, sorry, it's going to be... So he's going to choose this one over here. And what we're going to see is that you might say, oh, the value of the game is 5. But this is not a saddle point. This 5 is not a saddle point because uh, it's not, what are we saying? It's not the largest in the column. Well, it's the largest in the column, but it's not the smallest in the row. 1 is smallest in the row. So what this means is the game is not going to settle to this point. Because think about it. If you're player A and you know that player B is going to choose option 2, then you might decide to be cheeky and switch your strategy to option 1 and then the value of the game or the payout of the game is just one point. It's cheeky because if player B knows that you're going to do that, well then he's also going to play player one, uh, option 1 and he's then going to get 7 points. But if you pretend to him that you're going to do that, and you don't do that, so you trick him, you could then play option two and make the payout negative six. And you can see this starts going around in a bit of a circle. So how do we do, or how do we play in this situation? You know, what is the best strategy? Well, one of the strategies that we can employ is to be totally random. So if we apply a random strategy in the long run, this is going to be our best bet rather than going to some psychological warfare with the other player. So if there's no saddle points, what we're going to do is we're going to assign probabilities to the various options. So if I'm player B, I think player, player A is going to choose option 1 with probability P and option 2 with 1 minus P. What this now allows me to do is I can have my loss function. So this is saying the loss function for decision one at various p is going to be the payoff times the probability that player A chooses that plus um, the other payoff times the other probability. And this gives us 13p minus 6. We do this for the second one as well. We see 1 times the probability plus the payoff times the probability. And we're left with the following situation. Now, I'm just going to move this over here. Now, what we can do with these values is we can solve them for P to see when we should use which strategy. But to help out, I'm just going to draw this graphically. Maybe let me raise the axis a bit. Because what we're going to see is for the first one, this 13p minus 6. And let's say this is the value of p. So that's p0 and it continues there. This is going to start somewhere down here at negative 6. And as p increases, it's going to increase. Let's get a different color. Let's say for this value here, 5 minus 4p, this is going to start at 5, and then it's going to decrease as p increases. Now, what is interesting is we see that over here, 
all these probabilities, um, this option is better. And for all of these ones going forward, option one is better. But we want to see where they intersect. So where they're going to be intersecting, I mean, that's very simply a 13p minus 6 equals 5 minus 4p. And we solve for p to be 11 over 17. So we know that p is going to be 11 over 17, which means, um, you know, 11 over 17 of the time, player A is going to choose option 1 and the rest is going to choose option 2. So we have to vary our strategy accordingly. And then to get, say, the value of the game, we just put this 11 over 17 into either one of these equations. And we're going to see that the maximum expected loss or the payout of the game is 41 over 17. So that's how much player B must pay player A in order to engage in this game so that it is fair. And there we, we've done it. So we've finished the, the very first part of the videos. We've looked at domination. We've looked at the mini-max criteria. We've looked at saddle points. And we've looked at random strategies. In the following lessons, we're going to go a little bit more complicated. It's going to be, become a little bit more detailed. So take a quick break, and I'll see you then for that video. Good luck.